everyone, welcome to another episode of the Tour de Greaves Cycling Show in association with Sportshead and the Dave Rayner Fund, the Rayner Foundation. Uh, delighted to say that today we've got fresh from uh, a very brutal tour of the Basque Country, uh, Tom Squinge of Trek Segafredo. Tom, thank you so much for joining us. Uh, we've kind of grabbed you on a rare day off at this time of the season. Um, you were just saying then before we, we kind of press record, you were feeling slightly better than you thought you were going to do at the end of uh, the tour of the Basque Country. Yeah, I mean, today I'm feeling better than I thought I would uh, because yesterday was obviously a hard stage and also a six hour drive back to Girona. But um, yeah, I guess not finishing the last stage helps uh, <laughs> recovery. <laughs> And you've had a pretty, I'd, I'd, I'd say you've had a pretty kind of, you've not set up your, your early season to be easy. I mean, you've done Strada Bianca, you've done Milan San Remo, you've done Terreno Adriatico. It, 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 there's obviously, you, you've obviously either really annoyed somebody at Trek Segafredo to keep putting you in for these really, really brutal and long races, or, you know, it, it's how you like to play things. Which one is it? Are you, is this where you find yourself at home in these harder races? Yeah, I was actually counting uh, the weekends that I've had off since uh, I started racing, which was in Obar in February, and there's been one weekend off. Wow. So, wow. yeah, I mean, but for me, it's hard to say no to racing. Even uh, this Wednesday, Brabant's Appeal is one race that was not really planned. Uh, the team was not really planning on doing it uh, from the get-go, but then... Um, yeah, they kind of were like, hey, we're going to do it after all. You should come. And uh, so <laughs> I, I enjoy <laughs> racing. It's hard for me not to say no to races. Uh, so it's it's harder for me to decide which races I'm going to uh, than which races I don't want to do. Yeah. Is there a feeling that given given the year that we've had with the, the pandemic and, and everything else that's been going on, that actually the, there is that kind of desire just to kind of keep racing because we don't know when some of these countries are going to close. Obviously, today we're recording this when on the day when we should be watching Paris-Roubaix. Is there a feeling that you want to get as many race days in as a team, but also as an individual, just in case you know some of these races disappear or get shunted towards the end of the season? Actually, not really. Uh... I can see why uh, that could be an argument, but I think with our team, we still really focus on the quality of the races and actual schedule for it and not just go to every single race that we can because obviously there's there's a lot of races on the calendar and not every single race really either fits in well or makes sense to do. Um, so, I mean, we always have guys, even now we have some guys at uh, training camps uh, in altitude. so. There's always some people that are getting race ready and some others that are racing. And you need to find that balance because if you pick too many races, then uh, pretty soon you can end up with uh, not that many fit riders anymore. Yeah, or definitely. healthy. Yeah, I guess it's getting that balance into it. I mean, you you know, the, the demands of the, the cycling calendar at the minute, it's it's kind of it's you know it's, it's not double race day, d double race programs, it's triple race programs, isn't it? If you were one of these teams who sent teams to every single race you you could, I guess. But you must be pretty pleased with the starts of season as a team. I mean, you know, Jasper winning um Milan San Remo, you know, I guess getting a big race win um is always good, but getting one so early, first monument of the uh the, the season what was what was this what were the celebrations like i mean I, I kind of saw quite a bit on social media it must be must be really pleasing when you get one of those victories i mean the attention was obviously elsewhere um and and jasper you know launched his launched his attack and and kind of held out if you will what what was that day like for you yeah i mean it's definitely as you say uh really nice to get a big win like that and the team has been doing super well uh, even if me personally, I always want to do better uh, myself and maybe haven't had the start of the year I was hoping for. But uh, yeah, as a team, we've uh, we've really had some nice wins and I've been uh, part of quite a few of them, which is always a good sign as well. And uh, yes, and Ramo, I mean, it was, it was really incredible. I could not believe when I was hearing in the radio that uh, Jasper's uh, going for it. And uh, I mean, 
I couldn't believe in the moment, but at the same time, Jasper has always been there. He's won some big races already before. Sure, San Remo is the first monument he has ever won, but I'm sure it's not going to be the last one because uh, he's really a rider that uh, I'm happy to be supporting. He's a rider that gives it his best and uh, can teach can teach others a lot. And um, yeah, it's uh, of course the celebrations afterwards were also. Uh, we can hide our excitement, and uh, I was waiting for every single rider to cross the cross the finish line. And Ryan was a little bit further back, but we still waited for him. And uh, yeah, then we waited for Jasper to get back to the bus after all the interviews, after all the um, yeah doping controls and whatnot. So uh, yeah, it was a good time. Trek as a team feels like a really kind of, you know, you look at that roster, you've got monument winners, you've got former world champions, you've got grand uh, grand tour winners. What's it like riding in that collective? I mean, you know, the, the kind of collective worth of all that talent in terms of victories and in terms of skill sets with, you know, yourself and Vincenzo and Balcom Olimer and Jasper and Mads and things like that. It's one of those squads that just feels really kind of, you know, I guess everybody can learn from everybody because everyone's got different skill sets and everyone's got really impressive palmareses as well yeah i mean maybe we don't have one big superstar that's uh like pogachar or roglic or sagan or oh, okay sagan maybe not anymore but guys like that that are like head and shoulders above the rest but i think that just the quality of the team we have as you said just because so many guys have had so many results and still are getting those results it's uh, it's definitely something not a lot of teams have and uh, that's why yeah as you said you can learn not just from a classic rider but also from guys that have won grand tours or podiumed in grand tours and uh, so on and yeah you mean i mean you see them at team camps you see how they ride you see how dedicated they are and it's always it's always a good motivation to keep pushing yourself as well. Yeah, definitely. And you mentioned that you'd perhaps not had the you know start to the season you were looking at. How do you measure success? I mean, we've just mentioned all the kind of people who we see cropping up in in big races and winning big races. How do you, as a cyclist, you know, perhaps who doesn't get afforded the same chances or not as many chances, how do you measure success? Um, I'm always kind of quite interested in, you know, when you, you know, you're not somebody who's perhaps winning monuments and 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 there at the sharp end in in all of the big races. What what do you see as a barometer of success? I mean, for me, definitely, it is more the feeling I have uh, of how I feel on the bike. And uh, this year, I've just had, yeah, some quite a few races where. I've been limited by just my back pain, which is very mm. annoying. And uh, also yesterday, I mean, Basque Country is a lot of climbing, a lot of steep climbs, and it's a lot of demand on the back. And it actually was the main reason why I just was ready to call it a day because yeah. all I could think about was my pain in the back. But I'm trying to figure that out, where that's coming from and why that happened. Uh, but other than that, I mean, yeah, I definitely look at how well i'm doing in the races and um as a collective as a team we are doing because yeah it if you're part of the monument winning team and if you're part of the team that wins uh the first uh one of the first stage races of the year then i mean it's you you don't make that team just because you're one of the riders you make it because they need you there and you you're there to help and um yeah, so that's uh, that's also obviously a way I measure my success. Yeah, because cycling is such a strange sport, isn't it? It's kind of almost a, a team sport for individuals or an individual sport for teams in that kind of, you know, the casual observer doesn't see that kind of first 100k that somebody's done. And there's lots of, you know, lots and lots of examples of, of you know, riders whose job is in that first stages to get into breaks and things. Um, 
what what kind of you know looking ahead to to kind of the next couple of years for you what uh what are you hoping might kind of transpire you know obviously subject to you working out the the, the obvious back problem have you got kind of things you still want to tick off have you got things that you've chatted to the team about in terms of opportunities in certain races i definitely want to do the giro that's one of the races i haven't actually ever done and uh, that's one thing I want to take off the box. Not going to be this year, but uh, hopefully in uh, yeah 2022. Uh, same with Roubaix. Roubaix is also on my list. Uh, maybe I get lucky this year with the postponement. Maybe I get to do it. Uh, it's the one monument I'm missing. Um, so there's a few races like that that I haven't done that I want to do. Even Paris Nice I haven't done, even though it's not anything extraordinary but i would like to do it uh, at least once um but personally result wise i mean i think i can still be in the fight for one days and i still think that um, as i did last year i can be in fight for grand tour stage wins yeah. and uh, that's what i want to do i, I want to be not just in the fight but also win a few uh in the next coming years and that, that yeah that, those are the main goals personally result wise yeah and um, and just in terms of your kind of social media presence and things like that i always find it really refreshing when when kind of sports stars are as as open and and kind of give a real glimpse into you know what life is like and you know i'm a big football fan and you don't tend to get very much of that from a footballing point of view what is it about cycling that kind of i don't know perhaps connects with uh, with fans and certainly you're somebody um you know along with with other kind of riders of your age and and kind of um on, on your team as well that kind of wants to be connected with fans how important is that for you well i think when you say sports stars you can't really include me <laughs> but uh i mean cycling in general i think is we all know it's a sport where the public is right there and okay maybe not right now not with the pandemic going on but if you look at basque yesterday there was uh, quite a few people yeah. And even though maybe they shouldn't be there, uh, I can't say that I didn't feel a smile rising on my face when I did see people on the roadside, um, which is maybe not the best thing to say, but it's the truth. Yeah, uh, It was nice to see people. And um, so I think, yeah, just because we have that access, we have those interactions with fans more than someone playing on a soccer field or someone playing tennis where the stadium is the people are quite quite a bit further away yeah i think that's what gives us also maybe the yeah the i don't know not confidence really but uh it kind of makes it normal that you also interact with fans off the bike yeah um like off yeah off when you're not racing but uh i think cycling as a sport in general as well or not even as a sport cycling as riding a bicycle along the streets is something that can bring people together and there's so many mass participation events that uh that it, it's all about bringing people together and i think that's why it's also nice to actually interact with people not just uh yeah not just be on your own and i don't know do the climbs as fast as you can, but also have a, have a chance to look around and see who you're riding with. Yeah, definitely. And what do you make of? Um, obviously, we saw um, in in Flanders uh, Michael Shaw um, throwing a bottle to a fan and then instantly realizing that he'd he'd kind of broken these new U, uh, UCI rules. What do you make of the the lawmakers within the sport kind of introducing, you know, these new these new rules? The super took obviously, and 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 also the kind of you know, banning the throwing of bottles to, to fans on the side of the road. I get from the optics point of view, we don't want to see litter being left, but what do you make of the whole kind of discarded bidons argument that seems to be raging at the minute? Yeah, I mean, if we're talking super tuck and whatever else they banned, I don't really see, I don't really care about that. Uh, they can ban it, whatever, I'm not going to do it. If they don't ban it, yeah, I'm going to do it. Uh, 
there's arguments. Oh, it looks dangerous. Oh, kids will try it. But I mean, there's so much other sport things all sports do that no one at home in their garage will try, you know? Um, people sometimes forget that they need to use common sense. Yeah. And uh, not everything you see on TV should be replicated in your household. Um, but uh, regarding, yeah, regarding the beatings and giving bottles to fans or throwing them to the fans, yeah, I mean, I think it's pretty silly. Um, to make a rule that doesn't allow that. I wasn't one that grew up uh, cheering people on like cyclists on the roadside and yeah. trying to get bottles, but I see the faces of kids when they do get a bottle. Um, so maybe in Basque country, I might've given a bottle or two away. I'm not sure, maybe, maybe not, who knows? No one saw it, no one can come back at me now anymore. Uh, but instead of throwing, what happens if I'm just holding the bottle and then someone just grabs it? It's not, I didn't throw it, so it's all okay, yeah. right? Um, anyways, but uh, yeah, I mean, I think it's silly, but at the same time, I also understand, like, for example, I've raced in some incredible places like Tour of Alberta brought us to the Yasper National Park, and that was uh, just my mouth was wide open not because i was breathing so hard but just because it was like so spectacular yeah. and then i did see some guys throwing bottles in uh, rivers and that was not nice like yeah. you see where they're coming from but i think there should be there should be some leeway and if you give it to a fan it shouldn't be a disqualification yeah um uh, sure you can give fines but i mean to disqualify a rider for throwing a bottle or losing a bottle if they suddenly think that you did it on purpose is yeah a bit ridiculous yeah definitely um i wanted to ask you also about obviously the the women's side of the sport trek um Segfredo, one of uh i think the first uh team to to kind of equalize the minimum pay for um for both the men's team and the women's team and uh, i know bike exchange have uh have done that since as well how important is that in terms of a step in the right direction for the sport? I mean, obviously, Trek have got a very successful uh, women's team, some some big stars on that team. But when we're looking at kind of things that perhaps the UCI could get involved in, in terms of trying to um, you know equalise the sport and get parity around pay, how kind of important is it for you as a team that you are seen to be doing um, just that and, and equalising the pay between the men and the women for the the kind of minimum minimum wage bracket? Yeah, I mean, the UCI is trying to do things better and better. But as we all know, there's a lot more things that uh, they should be doing. Uh, even, yeah, when in Flanders, one of the girls got a fine for throwing a bottle or littering or whatever. And it was more than the prize money for the winner. I mean, that's ridiculous. And they really sometimes don't realize how in equal they make it um so yeah i i'm really really fortunate to be part of a program that actually is supporting women the way it should be and giving them all the resources that we have getting the pay right and just getting them in a place where they don't have to have a second job to actually be a pro bike racer because as we have heard um there are quite a bit of quote unquote pros that actually don't make a living salary and have to find some an, another income elsewhere. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. And just finally, before we let you go, you, you've obviously raced up close with um, over the, the start of this season, Wout Van Aert, uh, Matthew Van Der Poel, Primoz Roglic, Tade Pogacar, uh, David Gadu, of course, as well. This we we I guess we're quite privileged at the minute that there's so many kind of stars in the sport 
what what what's your take on the kind of you know the talent that we've got in the sport at the minute kind of outside of your team and we've talked about the the riders in your team but we've got a lot of young talent i know primos perhaps in, wouldn't be including the young uh talent pool anymore but what what do you make of the talent that's coming through there's some phenomenal athletes out there no it's, it's definitely true what you're saying there's quite a quite a bit of you guys that um um are there and making races really hard for people that have been in them and just making them more exciting. Like, uh, even though you didn't mention him, but the same guy, Remco, that we haven't seen uh, this year, he's still very young and still has, uh, from the looks of things, quite a big season ahead of him. And no one actually knows where, where that will take him. But I, I mean, I think it's great. I think it's uh, super exciting to have more more and more riders and uh more and more guys that are really coming out and hitting yeah hitting the big races at a young age where they maybe don't take it as like crazy serious sure there are guys that are taking it even more serious at a younger age than i am right now yeah um and i don't think those guys will have such long careers in general because they'll just burn out but uh, at the same time if you look at Tade he he has fun with it and uh, that youth in him still keeps him grounded and as long as he keeps uh, keeps doing what he's doing right now he's uh, going to be unstoppable for quite a few years I think yeah definitely uh, what a time to be uh, what a time to be trying to compete with uh, with them guys they just look kind of completely unstoppable at uh, at times don't they Yep, that's very true. Excellent stuff. Well, thank you so much for, for coming on the show. We wish you all the very best starting uh, midweek at Brabantspiel in Belgium. Um, and yeah, hopefully we'll, we'll perhaps get you back on the show later in the season and we, we perhaps celebrate uh, uh, a win for you in uh, in a one day or a, a Grand Tour stage, hopefully, Tom's. Sounds good. Sounds good, good to stuff. me. Thank you very much. Cheers, mate. <laughs>